Margaret Atwood grew up first years in the forests of Quebec. And Dave, you grew up in Lake Forest, to force an analogy. <laughs> what do you think each of you, let's begin with you, Margaret, if we can, made you a writer? Well, um, there isn't much to do when you're uh, <laughs> living in the woods with no electricity and uh, no school, no uh, theater, no um, library. Uh, so basically it's reading, writing, drawing, and that's only when it's raining. So I think that's what, you know, Vote de Mew, there wasn't anything else to do, so I became a writer. <laughs> Did you write to, to engage yourself? Uh, well, what I wrote first was comic books, mm -hmm. because it was the uh, comic book age, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how I taught myself to read, because nobody would read me the funnies. Do you remember the funnies? Okay, they used to be the, on the weekend, yeah. and of course we didn't get a newspaper much, but when you got one, when you got hold of one, there would be the funnies. So I wanted to learn to read those funnies, and that's why I did it. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to draw them, and I've continued to draw them. Um, I've, I've lately been the collaborator on a series called Angel Catbird, which I wrote. My drawing wasn't good enough to draw an anatomically correct flying uh, catbird human. So I have a... <laughs> I don't think anybody's drawing would Oh, no. Yeah. Johnny Christmas is the name of the guy who can draw that. And he is my illustrator. But at heart, it's a bird conservation project. Yeah. You're giving me the fish eye. No. Yes, you and are. neither is it a bird eye. No. <laughs> Okay, so, so ask yourself this question. We know that the four um, major foes of, of birds are glass window collisions, uh, habitat destruction, toxins, and um, cats. <laughs> and cats I'm and sorry for that. Yeah, I know, and this is the problem, you see, because people tiptoed around this. <laughs> it's not good to say to cat owners, your cat is a dangerous predator and you must drown it in the toilet because you won't get, <laughs> you won't get any results that way. But if you Ma Margaret, create... it's none of my business, but I, <laughs> I just wouldn't get on cat owners. No, 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 form, no, no, okay? no, no, this is the point. Yeah. You can't do that. But if you create yeah. a lovable, flying, part cat, part bird superhero that understands both sides of the problem, then you can get traction. Okay, no more fish eyes. <laughs> now I get it. It's it a very understanding itself. cat, yeah. Um, Dave, you grew up in Lake Forest where there, there might be a few more diversions than what Margaret described in her childhood. Uh, uh, sure. No, I've yeah. been there. <laughs> but, oh, <yeah. laughs> I, uh... Yeah, how many, how many tables a did we just lose? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a police car drew over yeah. and asked me if I was all right. Well, oh. while we're speaking, do you... That happens. Do you, do Every you want, time I go home, they pull me over. I swear to God. They pull yeah. you over in Lake Forest? Yeah, they're looking at my old church. They pull me over. <laughs> looking at my old house. They pull, I don't know why. They, they don't like sideburns or something. Because you're, because you're outside. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, um, no, it was a very, it, obviously, very... Uh, a nice place to grow up, and I had great, uninterrupted stream of amazing teachers. So my first great teacher, Mrs. Wright, assigned us to write a book, and I wrote a book, and we glued it together and bound it with yarn, and I still have that book. And then in fifth grade, Mrs. Dunn had us do another book, and this, I think, was sort of the turning point. I'd been encouraged by these teachers, but always, but, um, but Mrs. Dunn, I wrote this book called Gleeble, about a friendship between a little boy that was scared of monsters and an actual monster, and you know, you can write the rest of it in your head, it's uh, very corny. Um, but Mrs. Dunn thought it was uh, good enough to nominate me for uh, a convention of young authors that was going on, at, and it was held at Southern Illinois University. So my mom drove me down the six hours or whatever it takes to get down there, and, um, and there, a room this big, 
of young kids, fifth graders, sixth graders, seventh graders, was all there, and Gwendolyn Brooks spoke to us. Oh. And we all got a chance to meet her and you know, sort of have an audience afterward. And to be sort of recognized that way and kind of lifted up and sort of put in the company of the Poet Laureate, like it, yeah. it, was, uh, it made an indelible impression. And it collapsed that space between here's this icon that you've heard of and read and sort of, and then here's us. And suddenly that space has collapsed and it seemed like an available thing maybe, you know? And so that, and then I just kept on having great teachers that kind of encouraged me in a career that I had no idea, you know, otherwise any access to. Yeah. When um, tragedy hit your family and you lost both of your parents in, in, in rapid succession, uh, and, and became the, the principal care for your brother. Did you know as you were living through it that you were going to write about it? Um, <clears throat> what's funny is I was a cartoonist at the time. So I used to have a weekly cartoon when I moved to San Francisco. Uh, and I thought, because I was, a, I was a painting major in half my time in college, and I studied at the Art Institute of Chicago and the American Academy of Art here, and. Um, um, that's what I thought I would do. So I was trying to explore it through uh, painting, which I have a lot of terrible paintings from that time when I was trying to sort of process it. And, um, but it was on, wasn't until maybe seven years later that it kind of coalesced into the form that it, that it, that it became. And, um, and I think every experience or every story has its correct form, whether that's fiction, nonfiction, a poem, mm -hmm. a painting, a terrible comic, whatever it is, you know, that I, I couldn't, I didn't have the drafting skill to make it right that way, but uh, it became, memoir became the sort of the, the right form for that. And uh, so it took a long time to sort of build up and gestate and, and, uh, and then it came out in a seven month flood. You know, that was, so you wrote it that quickly. Yeah, I told the editor to give me a totally unrealistic deadline because otherwise I'd keep putting it off for more years. So he did and, and held it to me and that was the writing, uh, that was the space of it. Uh, Margaret, first off, do, do you have anything you'd like to get off your chest about Will Met? What? <laughs> we'll met it at Lake, next to Lake Forest, that's all right. Oh, no, 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 I've never been there. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> Just like Forrest. I think I see a very <laughs> enjoyable trip coming up, so. Um, Handmaid's Tale, uh, as they noted in the introduction, was actually written 32 years ago. What do you think has made it speak to so many people now? I did not rig the American election. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll cross that possibility off the list it's, then. It's yeah. not my fault. <laughs> yeah. um, let us just say that the um, possibility, the plausibility has become greater rather than less. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has become greater within the United States, and it has also become greater in the eyes of the beholders of the United States. Because when I first published that book, people in Europe didn't want to believe it. You know, the Cold War was still on. I actually started writing that book in West Berlin with the wall still mm. encircling it. And uh, the United States was a beacon of freedom and uh, openness and anti-totalitarianism. It, it was the opposite um, of what people in Cold War countries uh, were living under. And there was a film made of, of this book in 1989-90, and we, and we launched it in the two Berlins. It was just when the wall was coming down. Mm -hmm. um, so I bought several pieces of it. It was more expensive for colored. I think people went out at night and colored more of it and <laughs> sold pieces of the wall. So I've got a couple of pieces of the Berlin wall. Um, and we launched it first in West Berlin, and the conversation was all about the direction and the aesthetics and the acting and the kinds of things people talk about around films. Uh, and then we took it over to East Berlin, and it was the first time since um, before Hitler, uh, before the mm -hmm. Second World War, that, that they had had 
this kind of double launch. And the reaction there was quite different. First of all, people were very silent. And they looked at it, and they looked at it, and afterwards they said, this was our life. And they didn't mean the outfits. They meant the fact that you couldn't talk to people, you, uh, you couldn't talk openly to people, and you didn't know who to trust. So that sense of oppression, I don't know whether you saw that film, The Lives of Others, about East Germany. That's really what it felt like. Um, when I was living in West Berlin, I went across to the east, and I also went to Czechoslovakia and Poland at that time. And that was the atmosphere. Um, and that was why people there didn't want to believe that anything like that could ever happen in the United States. But now their view has, has changed. Mm -hmm. When you wrote the book over 30 years ago, was it a, some kind of warning? Did you see something that you wanted to call attention to? Well, I have a clippings file from that time. And I was clipping things out of newspapers and magazines and putting them in my clippings file. And I did, of course, a lot of research. Some of it was historical, some of it was contemporary. But you can go back and read clippings from newspapers in which people were saying pretty much what they would like to do if they could get the power to do it. Mm -hmm. And you were seeing some of those impulses being played out um, today in various states in the United mm -hmm. States, rolling back. There's some kind of idea that, that things were better when. When were they better? Who were they better for? You always have to wonder that. Um, but, but people were already talking about it in the 1980s. Number one, number two, every country has a, has a sort of foundational structure to it. Um, so the um, USSR's uh, secret police came from the Tsar's secret police. You know, it was a continuation of the same thing, except more. Um, China has had, has had for many years a very extensive bureaucracy which simply gets replicated from one regime to, to the other. Mm -hmm. What did the United States have as its foundation in the 17th century? It wasn't a religiously pluralistic democracy. It was a 17th century Puritan theocracy. So contrary to what you may have been told in school, <laughs> I get, I get to say it because they were my ancestors. They were some of those Quaker hanging yeah. um, Puritans. Dave, I, let me t I want to ask you about your novel, The Circle, which I uh, admire a lot, and a phrase that has stayed with me over the years, privacy is theft. Yeah, I... Um, this is something we're beginning to grapple with now. Well, I, you know, I've, I've been in... California, uh, at, in San Francisco for 25 years now. I graduated from Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and um, all right, <laughs> ILL. There we go. Um, uh, and then a, a few weeks later, uh, uh, we, my brother and I moved to Berkeley, and, um, and I've been out there since and, uh, in San Francisco. And um, I saw, you know, the birth of the internet you know, start in its most egalitarian, democratizing, uh, utopian ideals, you know, shared office space with Wired Magazine when they launched and all that. And, you know, you, you heard the most sort of, uh, I think, pure theory about it, sort of all the best uh, intentions and the best possible outcomes. And then over the last 25 years, it's, it's changed quite a bit, you know, not only become monetized and corporatized and the concentrate of, concentration of power and and wealth has been unprecedented, and um, mm -hmm. but also this idea that <clears throat> not only are we invited to share, which is fine, share your pictures or whatever, but we are uh, required maybe uh, to share. Our, uh, any sharing is held suspect. Like, why would you not mm -hmm. share? What a? What do you have to hide? And b? Why would you deprive humanity of what you know? You know. And so um, I thought. Because you see it quite a bit, like, well, 
we sure would love to see those photos you took in Saudi Arabia. Wouldn't the world benefit from that? And where were you when? And why don't you share your purchasing history? Because wouldn't that be interesting to your friends and others? And um, <laughs> so it sort of has this creeping uh, quality that uh, there really is no limit to it because you can't put that genie back in the bottle. The lines of what is private keep being moved back. And every time we you do try to put a little bit of a firewall between it, there's a question like, why, what, what are you hiding? And, and couldn't you, by giving up all of your you know, DNA and medical inf information, wouldn't that help humanity if we could aggregate all of that and see uh, you know, uh, pathologies and, and such from, from all of that aggregated medical data? So I think that we are heading, hurtling, without speed bumps, really toward uh, uh, a place where privacy is not valued uh, so much. I think that it's, um, it's very hard to go backward. But I think that there are steps every so often. I think some other companies in Silicon Valley are making efforts. But I think that as a nation, as a world, we have to set boundaries. We have to come up with a, uh, guidelines for uh, digital ethics, what's right, what's not, what do we think as a, you know, is, is where we want to be, and where are we going to pr protect that zone of privacy and, and self? You know, how are we going to be intellectually free unless we do have that private zone, you know? But, um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's one aspect of it. But the election part, I didn't see coming. I thought, you know, I, uh, I thought that social media could have some very dangerous consequences with democracy and, and the privatization of voting and things like that, but I didn't see this part coming with somehow Russians colluding with, you know, uh, uh, Jared Kushner. And uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> if that were to be proven, um, to somehow uh, send misinformation through people's social media feeds. It's beyond my, it's beyond my imagining. I, I Did I just get political? I'm very sorry about right. that. Um, this is Chicago. Don't yeah. worry. Um, you know what? The last time I was here was at President Obama's last speech, right around here at UIC. And uh, so it's very uh, strange to be back. Uh, it was less than a year ago. Can you imagine? Less than a year ago, our yeah. president was President Obama. It seems like, what, centuries, 150 years, uh, whatever, I don't know. But everything, sorry, That's back right. to you. Take, take a deep breath while I ask a question. I, I don't think you're on Twitter. No, I have I not. I have you. not twid But you're twid very active on Twitter. Yes, yes, it was an, um, it was an accident. Um, <laughs> I'm also now on Instagram, and the reason I'm on Instagram is that it turned out that two other people were on Instagram pretending to be me. And about the only way you can um, sort of get rid of that is to go on yourself and get verified. And that allows you to defenestrate the fake you people. And when I went on Twitter, um, it was an accident. Um, and, and now look, um, there were two other people, maybe there were the same two people, pretending to be me on Twitter and, and tweeting really sort of slushy romantic things. I mean, they weren't tweeting bad things, but they were tweeting these sort of mushball uh, <laughs> sentiments. So they, really, weren't, they weren't very good Margaret Atwoods then. They were very soft, wobbly. Margaret Atwoods. I, I, I took exception to them. I was really quite offended by them. Um, but, but, but they are no more. Yeah. <laughs> That's another way of taking care of it. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, I want to get you to talk about 826 National, which does such, uh, such important work. But let me begin with what I gather are the words over where the operation operate, where, where the operations run in Detroit. Well, uh, we you know we started in San Francisco, 826 Valencia is the address in the Mission District of San Francisco, and, and then it, community groups around the country, including here in Chicago, said, why don't we borrow this idea and make it local? And so 826 Chicago's uh, on Milwaukee Avenue. It, the Kendra Kurikana, who runs it, is right there. Um, the and table probably right some volunteers table 49. in the room. They. Uh, you know, it's, it's to uh, both help with students with after-school homework help. I was there today when they had a field trip uh, from a sixth grade school from down near Midway. 
they came in and created a book uh, called The Alien and the Toilet. I want to say that's the real title of it. We do not censor. We unleash and untether these kids. And, we, and so they amazing field trip. And these books that the students create are, because the Chicago Public Library is such a good partner, they put them in the Chicago Public Library system. So if you want to look up a book by a sixth grader from 826 Chicago, you can look them up. And they are in the CPL uh, database and in many of the branches. So how great is that, right? So, but, um, we have a center in Detroit, and uh, Amanda Uli, who runs it, she's here from down from Detroit. And on the building, we thought we needed a phrase to inspire all the kids that go into this space in Eastern Market. So we found a phrase by Margaret Atwood that said, a word after a word after a word is power. And we put it in four-foot giant steel letters on the exterior of the building, and it's there now. And Margaret was very kind to let us do that. So. Um, <laughs> Do you remember writing that sentence? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, but it, it's, it sounds good. But of course, like anything made of words, it's slippery. <laughs> because uh, not, not all books are wonderful, positive things in the world. Mein Kampf was a book. Mm -hmm. So word after word after word is power, and therefore you should think about what sorts of words you're putting out there. We don't tell the kids all that. We uh, just uh, <laughs> keep it to the positive, what you know? They, yeah. <laughs> so what are, they, what are they writing about? I remember a wonderful murder mystery that my daughter wrote around that age in which the murderer had laid out the, all the parts. You know, all the arms were in a sort of a line. and <laughs> It was very tidy. <laughs> We don't tell them that either. So uh, <laughs> your invitation to 826 Michigan, it will be delayed a bit. We'll have to <laughs> talk about parameters. And uh, it's so her impression. So what are they writing about? Well, you know, we, um, they are encouraged to write about uh, anything they want to. And they write as a group. As a kids, you know, they, they create so a group together. So is it adventure stories? Yeah, they usually have a lot of adventure to them. And we are talk they about outer concept. space adventures. There's often outer space, yes. you know, a lot of speculative fiction, you might say. And, um, but they, you, uh, figure, might say, yeah. you know, I, they, I and then, but a lot of times, you know, the last book project, which is a paperback book that uh, it's about 200 odd pages, but it was pen pals between students from different schools across Chicago. And they might as well be from different worlds because you know, these kids don't often meet. And they wrote these beautiful letters between each other over the course of a, uh, a year and paper letters. You know? So for so many of them, it was the first letter they'd written. And, uh, but they grew to love it. And these letters are very moving. And they reveal themselves in a way. And, uh, are, they ma are they mailing them? Yeah, they're mailing they're them mailing back and them. forth. And the book is called P.S. I think you're somebody, you sound like somebody I can really trust. Oh. So it's like they get to know each other in this way, but you know, that's that, you know, the collapsing of space that you can do with the written word, I think, and especially if you can find commonalities across not just cultures, but across a city as big as Chicago. Um, it makes it a little smaller, it makes you feel a little less alone, and I think that they found sort of. Uh, you know, lifelong friends. And then at the end of it, we had a release party where all the kids got to meet each other, their pen pals for the first time. And that was... Uh, was that a big new. disappointment? <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Come on. <laughs> Is it always half glass full, half empty with you, <laughs> Margaret? Yeah. Just, um, just wondering. <laughs> yeah. No, but they were very kind of mellow about it, right? Kendra, they didn't get too excited. Yeah, it was a, like a middle school dance, you know, sort of waiting on either side, but, um, but very cute. And, um, you know, kids are natural storytellers, and um, they take to it very quickly if they're unleashed. And if you give them that, um, the right and the permission and the space and, and a tutor next to them that's going to be cheering them on and helping polishing their work, and then if you say it's going to be printed in a book, they will work their butts off, and they will meet any hurdle that you set for them. And, um, so at the high school level, the work they're doing is extraordinary because we hold them to professional standards. We're like, it's going to be in a book. You're going to be copy edited. You're going to be proof. It's going to be 10 drafts. And you're going to get there. And, when you, when, and once you reach that incredibly high new threshold of work, you can't go back. You're a writer. You know. So um, these kids are published authors. 
Uh, it was a kid that came to our fundraiser last night, Esperanza uh, Rivera, who's been published like 12 times or something. She's 14, you know? So, um, but giving them that, that permission and then amplifying and honoring their work in a professional product like that that'll be on a shelf like that forever, it's powerful. What, what would you... Uh, mm -hmm. What would you tell a young person who wants to communicate now why it's important to write? What does writing offer that so many different platforms being invented now? Well, that's a really big question. I, I don't think you can tell people that it's important for them to write. If they feel um, that they want to do it, you can help them, but you can't command them. Um, you can point out lots of ways in which writing as a, as a thing is quite different from, say, um, live performance singing. Mm -hmm. And it is, as you say, a way of collapsing space. It's also a way of collapsing time. And the, the voice of um, a written work is probably the closest you will ever get to communicating with a dead person, for instance, unless you're into the seances. Uh, and a novel is probably the closest you'll ever get to being inside somebody else's head. So uh, it is a doorway to empathy. It's a doorway to understanding other people who are quite different from you. Um, and it's also a doorway to understanding times that are quite different from your time. Well, it's been an honor to spend, uh, to spend some time up here with both of you, Margaret Atwood and Dave Eggers. Thank you very much for honoring the Sandberg Award. Thank you.